Okay, so it's one o'clock, so I guess we'll get started. Um, um, so first of all, hello everyone and welcome to the National Policy Challenge Finals. Um, this competition is a collaboration between the Canadian Research Data Centre Network, SAS Canada and Statistics Canada. And we're very excited about the projects that our finalists have been working very hard on and they've been working on them for months. So we're very much looking forward to their presentations today. Um, joining us today are our judges who will help us to determine the award recipients today. So uh, we have Hugh Cairns from SAS Canada. We have Mark Frenette from uh, Statistics Canada. Jeremy Higgs from BC Minister of Education and Childcare. Ramona Kiabagu from University of Regina. And then My Marion Steele from University of Guelph. So um, before we get started, I just want to um, address a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so first, I just wanted to let you know that the recording of this competition will be up on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of weeks. And um, second, we will be sending out a link to a feedback form towards the end of this, um, to, towards the end of the competition. So please do complete that form. It only takes a couple of minutes and it gives us very valuable feedback on, um, on basically everything, on, on, on planning our future offerings, basically. Okay, so now without further ado, I'd like to welcome David Howitt, who will be giving us the welcome address. Um, David is Vice President, Vice President at SAS, and he is responsible for the Canada section of SAS. <laughs> David, off to you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a big thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm, I'm sure that um, welcome is extended from the Canada Research Data Centre Network and Statistics Canada. So um, uh, as you've heard, we're going to hear from five, um, from what I can tell, is exceptionally talented finalists from right across Canada and, and the work that they've undertaken. Um, and I have to say that just looking at the subject matter, uh, there are some things that there was there were some items there that really caught my attention. Um, uh, I moved to, across the pond uh, uh, in 2009 and my kids were five when we moved they're now 18 and that I actually happen to have my in-laws staying with us at the moment so that kind of it is always that that role of the grandmother piece and how my children have been affected by the early stage life with grandparents with them on a regular basis to uh, not having their grandparents very much is, is a really kind of core topic that uh, it's my heart, if you like. The other area that I thought was really, really interesting is um, about cannabis use. Um, uh, I worked in the construction industry uh, around the world for, for many years um, with different rules and uh, requirements around um, cannabis uh, or any kind of um, drug use, really, in the, in, in the kind of safety-related orientation. So... Um, we, in some locations, we had a bigger challenge with cannabis use uh, than we did with alcohol use, which is kind of a really interesting thing and, and something that uh, Canada, with the change in laws uh, over the last couple of years, um, is likely to see some effect from that in safety critical work. <clears throat> Um, so I, I found those two particular topics, not to pick anyone out, but uh, those particular topics really, really interesting. Um, uh, I, um, as, as, as been mentioned, my name is David Hewitt and I lead SAS's operations in Canada. Um, SAS have actually provided the analytic tool set used by the competition participants um, to explore data provided by Statistics Canada. Um, and um, it's, it's a really kind of, the, the, the collaboration between the universities and, and industry and companies like SAS is really kind of a fantastic thing. Uh, at the moment, the demand for talent in the data and analytics space is incredible. It's really unprecedented. Every customer that I talk to has a massive challenge with having talented individuals um, or bringing through talented individuals in the data and analytics space. Um, of course, that's being fuel fueled by digital transformation in almost every aspect of our life, uh, in every segment, in every sector. And um, the pandemic and limitations on social contact, working from home, 
to name a few things, have just accelerated that. So it's bringing more structured data out there to analyze and in fact, more demand for talent in that same area. Um, so when you look at that, competitions like the National Policy Challenge, that's really helping that to develop that talent and, and also it's kind of differentiated in a way by giving student researchers secure access to really large data sets, which otherwise they wouldn't have. Um, and, and that opportunity to explore their curiosity with evidence-based policy solutions. Now it's a real differentiator for the talent that gets to come through this, this program. So I'm absolutely certain that every one of these finalists and probably everyone who took part is a winner in one way or another um, uh, in what they've done. Um, it's, it's a really um, fabulous opportunity to get that experience and a real valuable commodity for each of those careers as they go forward. Um, so maybe to finish off, um, uh, you probably know this, but at SAS, we really value curiosity, um, really value using data for just causes um, and also developing analytic talent. So uh, that kind of sustains our business and um, sustains some of the advancements that we're making in society. So this, this competition itself matches up with many of the values that we have as a company certainly my personal values. So I've been delighted to, to introduce this and, and hand it over for the policy pitches. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for your address. Um, so now we are ready for the first component of the competition, which is the policy pitch session. And to start us off, we have Jennifer Frempong, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Manitoba. So Jennifer, off to you. Hello. Hi. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Frimpon. Thanks for having me. Uh, typically, we think of uh, family class migration as being mainly for immigration, uh, mainly as uh, unification with no economic benefit. My research shows that there is a significant economic impact of uh, family class immigration that, might imp uh, that may be undertone by the uh, policy. From 1992 to 1995, Canadian immigration policy shifted away from family class immigration to economic immigration. This led to decrease in the proportion of uh, parents and grandparents that immigrated to Canada after the policy, as shown on figure one. Since the, uh, since the literature has shown that proximity to grandparents have increases labor supply, any policy that reduce any policy that affect proximity to grandparents might have an, uh, an uh, might have an unintended consequence for labor supply. To so, uh, however, if you look at immigration policy, you realize that the, you realize that the uh, you realize that the intergenerational aspect of labor supply have largely been ignored. To fill the gap, I test the effect of policy on I test the effect of the policy on employment of immigrant women with young children. The using a uh, using using a triple difference model and a longitudinal administrative data bank. The result shows that the policy have a statistically significant, significant effect on employment of immigrant women with young children. Based on my research, I believe that we have, uh, we have underestimated the economic, uh, economic benefit of family class immigrants in the Canadian labor market. In that regard, policymakers should explicitly recognize the the contribution that family members make in providing uh, childcare and how these impact the labor supply of connected family members. If we, if we put this calculation in, in policies that set immigration policy, it will increase the labor supply of immigrant women with young children. In that regard, I also, I also argue that we should also uh, concentrate on immigrant women with young children who might be more in need of uh, social support. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and now next is Samer Hamamji, a PhD student at, at the University of Toronto. Samer. Okay, thank you, Perry. Okay, I will uh, have an overview of my research. In Canada, based on the, the public health agency, the increasing rates of diet-related chronic diseases are associated with increasing death and direct health care costs. In this context, Health Canada has reviewed scientific evidence related to healthy eating and chronic disease prevention and released in 2019 the new food guide. With its supportive guidelines, Canada's dietary guidelines for health professionals and policymakers, which emphasize the regular consumption of healthy food choices. Data on the association of adherence to these guidelines and cardiometabolic risk in Canadian has not been explored. So we developed a food choices assessment score using the Canadian Health Measure Survey, as it is the only available national survey in Canada, includes direct health measures and dietary assessment using a food frequency questionnaire. Results showed that the food choices assessment score is a valid score and was able to distinguish between different populations with non different in diet quality, such as smokers and non smokers, and revealed that Canadians with higher value of the score as higher diet quality were 30 to 52% less likely to be obese based on both body mass index and waist circumference respectively, and 35% less likely to have abnormal liquid measures. These findings will help policymakers to monitor diet quality in Canadians according to the new food guide and create targeted interventions to improve the overall health in Canadian population. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Samer. Um, next is El Zahra Majid from um, the university from Queen's University, and she's a PhD candidate at the university. Thanks, Perry. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Zahra, and today I am going to tell you a short story. Around four years ago, I decided to move from the beautiful country of Lebanon and come to Canada as an international student to obtain my PhD. And earlier this year, I became finally a landed immigrant. Moving to a new country carried its own challenges. And you know what is the transition and made me feel more at home? Running. Well, physical activity mainly. Physical activity played an important role in improving my health, integration, and overall immigration experience. However, this is not the case for all, for, for all immigrants. In fact, the healthy immigrant effect shows that the longer immigrants live in Canada, the worse health outcomes they can have due to their uh, many factors, including low physical activity levels. And why is that? Because there are no specific immigrant uh, physical activity policies and recent up-to-date immigrant physical activity data is lacking to inform these interventions. Well, my study aimed to fill that gap. My study showed that immigrants report low, low, low physical activity levels, worse health outcomes relative to more time spent in Canada, the healthy immigrant effect, varying relationship between sex, age, ethnicity, and different types of physical activity, and a positive relationship between integration, physical activity, and health outcomes. Therefore, Policies should come to the rescue and improve integration policies by including a health-related component in them. Policies should also take into consideration the acculturation effect and its impact on physical activity participation among immigrants. And finally, policies should implement and evaluate available suggested physical activity initiatives and ensuring proper immigrant representation that considers different factors such as age, sex, and ethnicity. And for more information, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Zahra. Um, next is Angel Poirier from University of Regina. She just completed her master's in economics. Go ahead, Angel. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I don't have a slide for my policy pitch, so I'm going to start my timer right now. The objective of this research is to identify how consumers of illicit versus legal recreational cannabis are different from each other. Why? So we can tailor policy instruments to the different groups to achieve certain policy goals, like reducing overall cannabis use or getting consumers to switch from illicit to legal. So my findings are that indeed the two groups are different. 
In the legal market, being male is the strongest predictor of consuming legal recreational cannabis and more of it. And in the illicit market, being teen, a teenager, is the strongest predictor of consuming illicit cannabis and consuming more of it. Living in a rural area also makes you slightly more likely to consume more illicit cannabis. So my policy recommendations are based on the objectives in Canada's Cannabis Act, which sets out as a goal to provide for the production of legal cannabis to reduce illicit activities. So if rural people are more likely to consume more illicit cannabis, then this isn't working. So I'd recommend making it easier for legal retail stores to expand into rural areas in Canada, thus giving rural people an alternative and they don't have to default to illicit. The Cannabis Act also says it wants to enhance public awareness about the health risks associated with cannabis use. And since my findings show that males and teenagers are more likely to participate in the recreational cannabis markets, both legal and illicit, then my policy recommendation is to focus any educational efforts towards males and teenagers. And this could be done, for example, in partnership with other organizations which already have an audience that's largely male and or teen. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Angel. And last but not least, Samantha Skinner, who is a PhD candidate at Western University. Samantha, off to you. Can everyone see the slide okay? Okay. So informal caregivers have an essential, an essential role in our healthcare system. In 2018, 24% of Canadians provided some form of help to someone in need. And we know that for the, and we know that for informal caregivers, the need for informal caregivers will continue to rise. While there's some benefits to informal caregiving, there are also negative health effects on caregivers as well. Caregivers require support, but there is limited supports available for caregivers themselves. There also is currently no national standard for informal caregiver supports. And it is difficult to identify which caregivers are most at risk for negative health outcomes because of the diversity in caregiving experiences. In order to tackle this challenge, I decided to use latent class analysis to identify different types of caregiving caregivers based on a variety of indicator variables. My latent class analysis showed six caregiving groups based on a variety of indicator variables, three representing casual caregivers and three representing intensive caregivers. Both casual and intensive caregivers had groups that experienced the low, a low probability of experiencing stressors, a moderate probability of experiencing stressors, and a high probability of experiencing stressors. Therefore, my first policy recommendation is that any national policy needs to be flexible as the caregiving population is very diverse and a one size fits all model will not work. The next part of my analysis is I took these classes of caregivers and I predicted whether or not certain caregivers had additional, whether certain caregivers had more, uh, a worse outcome on health. Surprisingly, strained casual caregivers had the highest probability of reporting poor self-rated mental health, self-rated physical health, and having a severe or very severe disability. <clears throat> Therefore, I recommend that national level policies should be comprehensive enough that casual caregivers can qualify for them, as usually only intensive caregivers qualify for supports. And casual caregivers may also be an overlooked group in caregiving research and subnational policy levels. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. So that basically concludes our two minute policy pitch session. Um, maybe we should give the judges a view a few couple of minutes just to um, finalize their scoring rubrics on that section. And then we'll start back with uh, presentations. <laughs> 